My name is John Muller, and I have the privilege and joy of serving here at our Capitol Hills camp campus as the campus pastor. And if I haven't had a chance to meet you yet, I would love to do that. would love to connect with you. I'm so glad that y'all are here because today begins in the church calendar, what's known as Holy Week. Now by show of hands, how many of y'all knew there was a church calendar? Anybody? Okay. Like five of you. Um, so I didn't know this until I've been a pastor for about three years. So there is a big church calendar, not Summit Church, we have one, and you can try to find it online. And so we, there's a big C church calendar where today is known as, does anybody know? Palm Sunday, that's right. Now, how many of you grew up in a church where you wave palm branches on your way in? That's just odd, that's just weird. <laughs> I grew up in that same church. It was weird every time, and all we would do was just hit our friends with them, right? Or my mama would take it from me and hit me with it, right? So that's, that's all Palm Sunday meant to me, and so I would appreciate us not handing that out. So if you're a kid here, we did it for you. And so Palm Sunday starts Holy Week, which is the triumphal entry of Jesus Christ into Jerusalem, which begins the clock on Easter week. And so throughout the week, there are days like a Monday, Thursday. I'm not gonna explain what that is. You can Google that and try to understand it for yourself. There's a Good Friday, which we are gonna have a Good Friday service here this Friday night that I want all of y'all to be here for because it's going to be completely different than our Sunday Easter service. And so this week is meant to look at the, the time that Jesus Christ entered into Jerusalem to die for your sins and then to defeat death and sin and raise back from the life to offer eternal life to you. And so today we are going to talk about Palm Sunday. And I love that because last week when Pastor J JD left us, he left us, if y'all remember, with King David leaving and actually fleeing the city of Jerusalem out the East Gate and going up the Mount of Olives. David, because of his sin and because of his shame and because his son Absalom was trying to kill him and had taken over the throne from him, had fled out of the East Gate, up the Mount of Olives, and then today we find Jesus in the Mount of Olives. And there's one thing I love about this story is that Jesus is going to redeem that walk of shame of David. Jesus is going to redeem that sin of David. Jesus is going to start in the Mount of Olives, come down and enter through the East Gate. And Jesus is not gonna be a king that flees. Jesus is going to be a king that remains, a king that stays, and a king that redeems. And so today, I want you to write this down. This is my main point of today. Jesus redeems as king. Jesus redeems as king. Jesus redeems you when he is king of your life. I don't know what you walked in here with today. I don't know what you have done this past week. I don't know what's going on in your life. I don't know if you got drunk again. I don't know if you looked at porn again. I don't know if you cheated again. I don't know if you failed again and sinned again and you're tied up in those things that constrain you again. I want you to know there is not a path of shame in your life that Jesus Christ cannot redeem. There is not a path of shame in your life that Jesus Christ cannot and has not redeemed. And so whatever shame and sin you walked in here with today, I want you to know that there is redemption offered for you through the life of Jesus Christ when he is your king. And so today we are going to talk about a redeeming king, a kingdom of redemption, a king that walked your path, my path of shame, and now offers redemption through his shed blood. So if y'all will turn with me, I'm going to be in Matthew chapter 21. Now the triumphal entry is in every one of the four gospels. It's one of the few stories that is. So if y'all want uh, some more accounts, you can look that up. But today I'm just going to be in Matthew 21 verses one through 11. So if y'all will read this with me. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethphage, to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, go into the village in front of you and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say the Lord needs them and he will send them at once. 
This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up saying, who is this? And the crowd said, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. Now, some of you might be here today and you might be new to Christianity. You might be new to church. You might be asking the same thing. Who is this Jesus? Who is this? And in fact, we all at one point in our life, whether we call ourselves Christians or not, have asked this, who is this? And I love that around Easter time, it's a great time to invite lost friends here. It's a great time for you to come because everyone is asking that because everyone is talking about it. Who is this? Who is this Jesus? And today I'm going to try to describe for you that he is the king that has redeemed you. And he is the king that has saved you. And he is the king that was promised to you. See, whenever... King David fled and went up the Mount of Olives in his sin and in his shame. He knew that there was a promise that was made to him. There was a promise that was made to him that there would be someone from his line that was going to come and going to rule and to reign. And I'm going to try to show you today from our passage that Jesus is that promised king. In order to do that, we need to go back beyond chapter 21 in Matthew into the last passage of chapter 20 to read and begin to answer, who is this? Who is this? Go up to Matthew 20, verse 20, or verse 29. And as they, the disciples and those that were with Jesus, went out of Jericho, a great crowd followed him. And behold, there went two blind men sitting by the roadside. And when they heard that Jesus was passing by, they cried out, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. The crowd rebuked them, telling them to be silent. But they cried out all the more, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. And what Jesus is about to do in verse 32 will change the world. And stopping, Jesus called them and said, what do you want me to do for you? Now stop there. We'll read verse 33 in a minute. It's startling there to see that Jesus didn't correct them. Two other times in scripture, Jesus had cast out demons. And whenever he did, demons were were like, oh, holy one of God. And he's like, hush, don't say that. Be quiet. Jesus had actually never let anyone call him the son of David. What's key here is that Matthew is being written to a Jewish audience. And so when they read this, they hear son of David and they know, wait, doesn't that, isn't that what was promised? The disciples who were all Jews heard these blind men cry out, son of of David, and Jesus didn't correct them. Another time, Jesus healed some blind people. And as he did, he pulled them into a room, healed them and said, don't tell anyone about this. Kind of like as an uncle, every time I give my niece and nephews candy. I'm like, don't you tell your mama. (laughs) And so Jesus told them, don't say anything about this. But now here in front of a crowd, in front of people traveling with them, they yell out, son of David. And Jesus says, that's me. For the first time, Jesus is saying, I am him. I'm the king. I'm the son of David that was promised to you. That's me. Does that not give you chills? Because the disciples, the hair would have stood up on the back of their neck. Because disciples are kind of like me and you. They think they know, but they don't really know. But here, these blind men cry out, son of David. And Jesus says, that's me. What do you want from me? Do you see that? By saying, what do you want from me? He is saying, I am the promised king that was sent forth before time began to save you, to redeem you. And that's why I am here. And I'm not being quiet about it anymore. That's who I am. 
In fact, I want y'all to see in 2 Samuel 7, verse 12 through 13, and then 16. This is the prophet Nathan talking to David. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up for your offspring after you who shall come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Verse 16, and your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. I love that on the Mount of Olives where David went in his shame, the king that was promised that his rule and his reign would have no end that now the promised king is standing on the same mount about to redeem all things and he is coming out and telling everyone that he is the promised king. He is the fulfillment of this scripture. Jesus is king and he's here to redeem. Now, whenever we see that he is going to redeem, we see that there has to be a reason for that redemption. And so let's go back and read chapter 21 again and just Pick through it verse by verse. Now, when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethphage to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples. Now, Bethphage, just to give you a little context, it's right beside a city called Bethany. And in Bethany is where Mary and Martha live. It's where Lazarus lived. It's where Jesus brought Lazarus back to life. And so a lot of people knew Jesus there. I mean, think, if somebody brought somebody back to life in Young, Youngsville, we would know, right? That's kind of what it is, which nothing crazy like that ha- happens there. So, um, But we would know. People would know. And so when Jesus sent them, they knew who he was. They, he was familiar with the air, area. He knew who all had livestock. And so he was around friends. He was around people that he had shared a meal with. He was around people that he had stayed with. And in fact, throughout all of this week, Bethany is going to be where Jesus stays because there there was a census done of Jerusalem about two to three years after this. And the census was about lambs. I don't know why it was about lambs. It just was. And there were 260,000 lambs in Jerusalem during Passover. Now, that's significant because Jewish law states that for the Passover feast, you have to have one lamb per 10 people. So that means there was about 2.6 million people here in this town. And so Jesus was staying on the outskirts in Bethphage, telling his boys to go get everything that he needs from the city in front of them in Bethany. So let's go to verse two, saying to them, go into the village in front of you and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say the Lord needs them and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet prophet saying, say to the daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. Now it's interesting that Jesus had donkey and a colt, right? But when you're a king, you want to ride an animal that has never been ridden. Now, how many of you in here have ridden an animal that has never been ridden? Anybody? How many in here has tried to have, have actually broken a horse before? And those of y'all that didn't grow up on a farm, I don't mean actually break a horse. I mean, make it from wild to not wild. Anybody break horses? Anybody ride horses? That's just odd to me. Um, I would never ride something that also has a brain of its own and could kill me. Um, And so I actually uh, rode a horse once that had never been ridden. And uh, my best friend growing up, David Brook, uh, he and I were working on a farm one one summer because that's what you do. And uh, the farmer had brought in a horse. I remember the horse's name was Peanut. Don't know why. And so Peanut was hanging out and all of our work had gotten done that day. David and I were hanging out at the farm into the evening. And as every 19 to 20 year old do, we begin to challenge each other, right? Like you really can't tell us anything. Um, And so he's like, I bet you can't ride peanut. I was like, oh, I bet I can. 
And he's like, have you ridden a horse? I was like, doesn't matter. Like I can do anything. I'm 19. And so, and so we somehow got Peanut over to us, but we didn't want to startle her. So we didn't want to put a saddle on her. So um, I rode her bareback and didn't have rain. So I just grabbed her hair, right? How happy are you when somebody grabs your hair? Are you thrilled? Do you say thank you? No, you begin to buck and yell, which is what Peanut began to do. And so Peanut began to jump and to buck. And I'm gonna be honest, I thought I looked really cool, but I did not. Um, I did not. I pictured myself as like, man, I bet this is awesome. It was not. I yelled somehow at my friend, count to eight, because I knew, I don't know how I knew this, in rodeos, you have to ride for eight seconds. And that means you won, right? So I yelled for him to count to eight. He counted to eight. I don't know why I didn't think this through, but I just let go as if the horse was going to stop at eight, right? As if Peanut and I were on the same page. We were not. And so I let go. Peanut bucked me off into a fence that I woke up in the farmer's house two hours later. And I have not been on a horse since, and I will not get on a horse again. So that is why you with a colt that has not been born, that, that has not been ridden, you bring his mama with him. And you want to say, it's okay, mommy's here, mommy's with you. And so that's why they have a donkey and a colt, because when it comes to a king, nobody can ride on the king's animal. Nobody's supposed to ride on the king's animal. And then in David's time, this is another nod back to David, that the donkey was actually a royal animal. It wasn't until Solomon's time that the horse became the big thing around, around town. So Jesus here is not only saying, I'm the son of David, but I'm coming like David, but I'm gonna do something greater than David. And everybody here is seeing this. And they're seeing what's happening. And I love that it's even a nod back to prophecy hundreds of years before him that we go back and we see that it says in verse five, say to the daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming to you. Your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of the beast of burden. Verse six, the disciples went and did as Jesus directed him. They brought the donkey and the colt and put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread the cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Now, cloaks is just because they didn't have a saddle and because they are seeing that Jesus is king. They want him to kind of walk on the red carpet, and so they're laying down their cloaks. The palm branches, which that's where, where we get palm branches for is the Apostle John's account of this. But the leafy branches, they would tear off the leaves and they would throw them in the air. And they would throw them in the air kind of like a uh, confetti or a ticker tape parade in our idea. So this is the king entering into his kingdom. They are laying down the red carpet. They are tearing off leaves and throwing them up as confetti and they are throwing a party and they are shouting and they are singing. Let's see what they say. Verse nine, and the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up saying, who is this? And the crowd said, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. Verse nine, the crowds were saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Now what they're doing here is quoting Psalm 118. During the Passover, which is what every Jew is making their way into Jerusalem for, that's why the population would swell to so big. During that time, they would sing Psalms. There were pil pilgrimage psalms, there were reflective psalms, there were psalms of ascent. But in Psalm 118, it's not a psalm of ascent, but Psalm 118 is what they are quoting here. It's what they are saying here. And I want y'all to read that with me. Psalm 118, verse 25 and 26 says, Save us, we pray, O Lord. O Lord, we pray, give us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. This whole passage is saying the king 
is here. The king that was promised to you through David, the son of David, is here. They are shouting and singing psalms. They're quoting Old Testament scripture. They are fulfilling it. Sorry, they're not quoting it. They are fulfilling it in front of them. Now, Hosanna, the word Hosanna means save us. Save us. Save us, we, we pray. Save us to the son of David. Save us in the highest. Save us. Now, each and every one of us in here want to be saved. We all actually want a king. Every one of us in here are ruled by something or someone. And if you think, no, I'm not. I'm a self-made man. Nobody's gonna rule me. Well, then you're king. Then you rule yourself. Everybody's got a king. In fact, the uh, famous church historian, uh, Bob Dylan, says this. He says, you may be an ambassador to England or France. You may like to gamble. You, may, you might like to dance. You may be the heavyweight champion of the world. You may be a socialite with a long string of pearls. But you're going to have to serve somebody. Yes, indeed, you're going to have to serve somebody. Well, it may be the devil or it may be the Lord, but you're going to have to serve somebody. Each and every one of us serves somebody because each and every one of us know we need to be saved. We're all shouting and crying out, Hosanna, save us, save us. Change me, change my life, change this, save us. And see, the crowd here, the Jews, are saying, Hosanna, save us, save us. But what they want to be saved from is the oppression of Rome. See, Rome right now has their boot on their throat, and they want Rome to be removed. And what they think is that when the new king comes, when the son of David comes, that he is going to deliver them from Rome. That he is going to remove Rome rule and he is going to take it out and he is going to reinstitute the kingdom of David. And that this new king now, Israel is going to be on top again. Like David did away with the Philistines, Jesus is going to do away with Rome. And so they think we're going to have a change in situation. What they don't see is that Jesus came for their salvation. But look, I'm guilty of this too. I want Jesus to change my life. I don't want him to change me. I want Jesus to change my circumstances. I don't want Jesus to change me. When I say save us, I would be just like, like them. God, save me. God, save me. God, change my situation. God, change my circumstances. And we do do this too. Many of us come in here today because life is hard right now. But if life was good, you wouldn't be here. Many of us come here because we feel like something is broken. But if it wasn't broken, you wouldn't be here. Many of us honestly treat God like all state. You know, you're in good hands with all state. And better watch out for mayhem, right? The mayhem commercials are awesome. Um, I love them. I love them. That guy just causes more chaos than anyone. But what does he say? You shouldn't have gotten that cut rate car insurance. You should have gone with Allstate and you would have been better protected from mayhem like me. Many of us treat God the same way. That we would be better protected from the suffering and the hurting and the sorrow and the trials of this life if we just call God. In fact, some of us treat God as if he's a famous person in our phone bank, in our contacts. And we're like, oh, something's bad. Let me call God. Oh, I need this. Let me call God. Oh, I need this. Let me call God. Let me get God to fix this. Let me get God to fix my life. Let me get God to change me. Because see, God can only redeem you when he is your king. Jesus only redeems as king. And what the Jewish audience here is missing is that Rome is just a symptom of their heart. Their sin, their flesh has its boot on their heart. And what they're missing is that they don't need a change in circumstance. They need a change of heart. 
And that's what Jesus is coming to do. In fact, many of these disciples that are with him right here, waving palm branches, throwing their cloaks on the ground. Some, I don't know who, who the two were that went and got the don donkey and the colt, but these disciples will die horrible deaths. Horrible deaths for Jesus. They will die horrible deaths because Jesus is their king. Jesus didn't change their situation at all. In fact, Jesus is coming in, redeeming the sin and shame of David to die. And Rome is gonna think they won. The Pharisees, the Jewish council, the Jewish rule is going to think they won. Jesus is not coming to institute a new kingdom. He is coming to change your heart. Now, I know that there are some of us in here that think, John, that's, those are words. But the sin right now in my life, Jesus can't redeem. If Jesus knew what was going on with me, Jesus, Jesus wouldn't have died for me. If Jesus knew what I did, Jesus would have chosen not to die. Well, I want you to know right now that Jesus, as he was on this cult, as he was coming into Jerusalem, died for you. I love Romans says that God demonstrated his love toward us. And that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Sin exists in this world. And because sin exists in this world, a savior must exist. A savior must come. And the savior's name is Jesus and he is king. He is the king that was promised not to change your circumstance, but to change your heart and to change your life and to do away with the sin that exists. So if you were here and you have sin and shame and you think there's no way God can love me, I want you to know that there is, that Jesus Christ made a way for that. And I want you to know that church, if you were here today and you're like, but I failed again, I sinned again. The sin that I thought was behind me came back in front of me and I failed again. God, I failed you again. You know who did not fail God? Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ came to live his life for you, to offer that to you so that through him, you could have eternal life. And what Jesus does on the cross and through this triumphal entry is he does away with sin and shame. So if you have been saved, if you have been redeemed, then no charge can be brought against you because it was held against the cross of Jesus Christ. So if you in your mind today are hearing the lies of God doesn't love, love you, or if he knew what you did, or if you told someone what you did, or if you got found out, God wouldn't love you. God is upset with you. God is angry with you. God is ashamed of you. I want you to know that Pastor JD is gonna talk about this on Easter Sunday but God turned his back on his son. God turned his back on his son who's riding in as king. God turned his back on him so he could turn his arms to you and he has never stopped loving you. Never stopped loving you. He will never stop loving you. There is no sin and shame that you have that Jesus Christ didn't do away with on the cross. And I love that scripture says that for the joy set before him, for the joy, in fact, in Luke's account, of this gospel, Luke 19. It says that when Jesus got to the crest of the Mount of Olives, that he wept over the city. He wept over the brokenness. He wept over the destruction that was going to come. You were on the mind and heart of Jesus Christ because he came to live and to die for you as your king. And the thing about that is forgiveness only exists when there is lordship. Your sins are only forgiven when Jesus is your king. When you have surrendered your life to him, when you have come to him, not to change your life or to change your circumstances, but to change you. Forgiveness for our sin only comes when Jesus is king. We can only be redeemed when Jesus is our king. And Jesus becomes our king by us surrendering our life to him. By saying, Jesus, we have sinned and we have fallen short of your glory God, forgive us, save us. I surrender my life to you. And when we make that surrender, when we give our life to Jesus Christ, he becomes our king and he takes away our sin. He takes away our shame and he frees us up from the guilt that exists in this world because of our sin and because of our actions. 
So I want you to know if you've ever trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, that he has died for you, that in your heart and in your life right now, there is no shame. There is no sin. There's also nothing you could do to earn this. There's nothing you could do to earn the love of God. Jesus chose to die for you. Jesus chose to give his life for you. Jesus chose to love you in your sin and in your mess. We're all sinners here today and I want us to know that we are known completely and loved completely. There's nothing hidden in your life and in your heart that Jesus does not know and has not died for. There's no sin and no shame that he has not redeemed. The path of sin and shame that you have walked are walking. I want you to know that there is a king that has redeemed it. There's a king that has come and we celebrate victory and we wave palm branches because he is victorious over sin and death. We serve a victorious king, a king that died for us, a king that went to the cross for us, a king that gave his life for us, a king that will never stop and never give up on you because he loves you completely and knows you completely. We serve Jesus Christ as king today. And as king, we submit to him. As king, we surrender to him. We don't need him to fix our lives. We need him to save them. We don't need a change of circumstance. We need salvation. And that salvation has been brought to you by a holy and perfect and just king that humbled himself and rode in on a donkey to die for you and to die for me. I wanna end our time by giving you a few minutes right now just to, in your heart, thank God for sending Jesus as your king to die for you. To thank God for sending his son to live the life that we were supposed to live and die the death that we deserve as our king. Because no charge can be brought against you because the king is for you. And so I want us to thank the Lord that Jesus is our king. Let's end our time together doing that now. Pray that now. And then our team and our worship team will come and lead us.